Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. Today, bringing you another really fascinating guest involved in creating a better tomorrow uh, on some really unique fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Dr. Venusia Nogueira, uh, Executive Director of the International Coffee Organization. Uh, which is focused on strengthening the global coffee sector, uh, promoting its sustainable expansion uh, in a market-based environment uh, for the benefit of all members of the uh, global coffee value chain. Uh, Dr. Nogueira comes from a family of coffee producers. Uh, from Brazil started her career actually though at Price Waterhouse Coopers Consulting. Uh, there she became a partner, worked for 15 years, and then started working directly in the coffee industry back in 2002, primarily with a focus on niche markets. Uh, went on in 2007 to become the executive director of the Brazilian Specialty Coffee Association. Uh, and then in 2022, took over as the executive director of the International Coffee Organization. Uh, she holds a PhD in Administration and Marketing from Rosario National University in Argentina, did her undergraduate work in Systems Engineering and Administration uh, from Pontifical Catholic University in Rio, and did both MBA and post-MBA work focusing on management, marketing, uh, and advanced project management at, uh, at FGV uh, Rio. And the International Coffee Organization was established back in 1963, to the aegis of the United Nations. Uh, it's the only intergovernmental organization for coffee, uh, bringing together uh, exporting and importing governments and currently uh, is involved in representing somewhere around 93% of world coffee production and 63% of world consumption. Um, a lot of interesting topics to get into today. Honor to have her with us. Uh, Dr. Venusia Nogueira, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Hello, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you and to, to have this talking about coffee, that it's part of my life and I hope it's part of the life of all of our, our audience as well. Absolutely, and I and I'm on. I think my fifth or sixth cup today, so uh, I enjoy it as well. Um, but I found it quite interesting. You know, I, I read quite a bit about you prior to the show, um, and, and despite uh, you know you having two grandfathers that were in the coffee business and a father, and growing up in uh, Minas Gerais, which is the main coffee growing area in Brazil. Um, you weren't that into coffee as a teenager and um, it went on to other things. For... <laughs> Talk a little bit about the beginning, if you would. I'd love to hear your background story uh, before coffee. Yeah, uh, well, I I almost was born in a coffee plantation because my family used it to live very close to the coffee plantation. But my mom uh, had time to go to the hospital and then I was at the hospital in the town. And I'm part of the fifth generation uh, in a coffee producing family in Brazil. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was thinking uh, about how to, to do my career. I, was, uh, I used to be a very, very good student. And I thought that uh, it would not be good for me to be in coffee, to be in my town, to be in coffee, because... I thought that coffee was very, very boring. 
I always uh, use it to hear my grandfathers and my father talking about the weather because it's raining a lot, it's not raining, it's hot, it's cold, or there is no price for the coffee, maybe we will have a price maybe next month. And I said, no, it, this is not for me. And then I decided to leave my town and go to Rio when I, I took my degrees and my piano MBAs as well. And where I, in reality, I started to work for PricewaterhouseCoopers too. And uh, so I decided to go to a uh, business administration, business uh, management, and in the first, before the business management to the IT, the information technology uh, career, uh, my first degree, it's uh, system engineering. And um, so I stayed on that for many, many years, for almost 20 years. And uh, when I decided to come back to my town, one of the points that it, I, I think is very important to, to emphasize here, it's that after four decades, we are still having the same uh, issues and the same thoughts in the teenagers about to be in the field, to be in the plantations, in the agro in general, not only in coffee. This is a challenge in, right now for many of us uh talking about uh food in general uh because we need to have attractives for the the young generation for the next generation to to be uh in the field in the plantations uh in order to have our delicious coffee or in order to have food for all of us absolutely absolutely and it was another, you know, interesting piece, um, you know, again, going back um, to your uh, sort of the education uh, period, especially when you're doing your PhD. I, I was really uh, impressed that, uh, if I may read the title um, of your dissertation, Comparative Analysis of the Strategic Positioning of Argentine and Chilean Wines, versus the competitive positioning of Brazilian coffees in the 21st century. This sounds like a topic that literally could start a war <laughs> comparing coffee and wine markets. But say a couple words about uh, uh, your dissertation, if you would, uh, and then we'll get further into coffee. Yes, uh, it was the point that I was uh, concluding my post-MBA uh, when some uh, professors from the Fundação Getúlio Vargas, invited me to be part of this group of the doctoral uh, degree. And, and they said to me, look, my in, in my post-MBA, uh, I, I made, I prepared a dissertation related to the Brazilian uh, uh, program for promoting the Brazilian uh, coffees, uh, that it's called Cafés do Brasil. Mm -hmm. And I criticized a lot the, the, the program during this dissertation. And then they said to me, look, you already have something almost there, almost done for a PhD thesis. Let's do it. And uh, I said, no, but this will be, this I already did. And uh, since I'm not doing a PhD, if I go to there and if I got this, uh, this degree and this title, uh, for me, it will not be for being an academic uh, profession right now. I'm in the private sector and my, my idea is to continue on that. But uh, if I decided to go. I need to have something that can challenge me and to be fun. And uh, so I started to, to study about the wines. And uh, at that moment, um, both Chile and uh, Argentina uh, were just launched their new uh, strategy, their new positioning strategy for, for the wines. And there are, for the people that don't know, there are many similarities about the sensory, sensorial profiles between wines and coffee. Uh, there are many things. Coffee is much older than, uh, I, I'm sorry, um, wine, it's much older than coffee. We, the, the history of wine, it's um, around 3,000 years already. And for coffee, 300 years. But 
for these niche markets to work with the specialty coffees, fine coffees, uh, they, uh, the methodologies to evaluate wines was an inspiration for the people that prepared it, the, 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 the first methodologies to, to evaluate the quality of the coffees. And then I thought, well, let's study about this. Let's try to understand how this uh, was uh, done. And then I decided to, to make this kind of uh, comparisons and to, to be to, to have all together. And it was very interesting because it's uh, they are two very close countries in South of uh, South of America. They are neighbors, and uh, but they have very very different strategies for for wines. They, um, for example, in Argentina, Argentina used to be the highest uh, wine consumption per capita in the world, mm. but very bad wine, mm -hmm. very uh, low uh, quality wines. And um, then they decided to go to the niche market, to the very fine wines driven by the Malbats. And they uh, could uh, reposition their production and they, they control this very well until now. And uh, in our days, we have the, the Malbats from Argentina with the highest prices in the, in the world. If we think about the new world of wines mm -hmm. and not the traditional uh, production of wines. On the other hand, in, in Chile, you have a production that used to be a good production for exporting, not for internal consumption. They uh, always uh, have been producing wines to export, and they decided to go to a, a, a strategy that they would like to be the highest or the biggest uh, supplier from the world uh, market. Uh, the, no, I'm sorry, for the new market of wines mm -hmm. with the very good cost and benefit. That means to have good wines with good price to spread in the world. Yeah. And here uh, in Brazil, in the case of Brazil, in the case of the coffee, what we have uh, used to have was something very similar to Argentina. The Brazilians uh, love coffee and we use it to have very low quality of coffee in our day by day, in, a, in the internal consumption in Brazil. And uh, so I found many kinds of similarities to for doing and to, to driving Brazil to this uh, niche market of these specialty markets to improve the quality for exporting, and but not only for exporting, but also for the internal consumption in Brazil. And I learned a lot from the wines to apply this in the coffee uh, area. Yeah, no, I, I see the analogies right away. And, you know, as um, I, I mentioned in your bio, you know, you you took over the executive director uh, leadership of, of of the Brazilian Special Coffee Association in 2007. And I know one thing that you've been really known for is this uh, championing the Brazilian coffee direct trade. Um, you know, I've, I've seen presentations, you know, to, where you talk about sort of this, um, uh, you, you actually put it into different waves. And I, if I don't have it right, you know, we're sort of in the third wave leading on to this fourth wave of coffee, the third wave being a lot of the, the specialty uh, niche opportunities. And then the fourth wave, you, as you described, and I'll let you get into it, um, the fact that we need to be able to scale up uh, these specialty opportunities at some point. Um, talk a little bit about sort of uh, your your leadership of, of of BSCA and some of some of these initiatives that you championed the last decade. I think they're important for where we're going in the discussion. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so in two thousand and two, I came back to my town uh, for a sabbatical. This was the the reason to to be there. And uh, so the traders, the coffee traders, invited me to to work a little bit with them. And it was because we were in a moment that we had the lowest prices for coffee in uh, in many decades. 
And uh, just for you know, it was uh, something like um, probably 20% that was we are paying right now for coffee, for the raw material. Mm -hmm. It was really, really low prices. And they said to me, look, you, are, um, you focus your career in niche markets and discovering these for many other products uh, from uh, PwC. And then now it's time to help us and to help us to, to find niche markets and some alternatives for the, the Brazilian coffees in, in general. So uh, first of all, I, I get in touch with um, the fair trade market and also other certifications that was uh, that were really starting at that moment, like which certified it, that was uh, merged with uh, Rainforest Alliance uh, mm -hmm. some years ago. And uh, sustainability certifications, uh, social certifications that's fair trade, and also organic certifications. And I got in touch with all these people, and day by day, step by step, I was uh, talking with many people and many leaders in the in coffee in Brazil. And uh, in a such moment, I was uh, managing. Before to manage the the BSCA, the Brazilian Specialty uh, Coffee Association, I um, managed. I used it to manage one organization that it's called uh, Coffee um, Brazilian uh, Coffee uh, Excellence for Coffee Center. That it is. Uh, it is still ongoing, and it's an education uh, institution. And they asked me to to prepare their curricula. And how to to introduce in a very practical way the new generations at that moment, twenty years ago, and uh, the new generations in a very practical trainings and capacity building for producers and how to, how to improve the, the, these producers. And doing this kind of uh, trainings and education programs uh, in in that area, it was very close to my town. Um, doing that for many, many people, many young people and having partnership with many different uh, stakeholders, I got in, in contact with BSCA and then knowing what I was doing, uh, they invited me to, to manage the, the organization, the association as well. So I started uh, managing both organizations in parallel, and uh, after three, three or four years, I decided that it was not possible to continue with both of them. And then I, I stayed with BSCA, uh, doing a lot of job uh, internally, this reconstruction of the, our chain in Brazil, and also promoting the, the, the Brazilian uh, specialty coffees outside of Brazil worldwide. Excellent. Excellent. So moving on from there, as mentioned, you take leadership of um, uh, you know the International Coffee Organization a couple of years ago. Um, clearly, this is you know the preeminent organization for uh, the highest authority for uh, global coffee. And I mentioned some of those numbers. Could you just talk a little bit about uh, the history? Um, I, I know it oversees um, what is known as the ICA, the International Coffee Agreement. And if you could talk a little bit about what that is, and then just a little bit of uh, background in, in terms of where you, I mean, I know you're in London right now, but a little bit of sort of the, the structure of the, of the current organization, um, you know, per its situation in London. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, uh, the SEO was uh, uh, created to operate the first international coffee agreement. The international coffee agreement, it's an international treat signed by governments. Uh, national governments. This is a very, very restrict um, treat, kind of treat, and it was organized and planned uh, via the United Nations in New York. Uh, that This was in the moment in the early 60s uh, that there was, uh, I think we can say, a wave to, to try to regulate the markets mainly for the commodities. 
uh, after the Second War, the United Nations uh, created a lot of agencies to support many of the challenges worldwide and also uh, stimulate or motivate uh, many of the, the sectors to, to create roles to try to, to find a, a balance between price, uh, between supply and demand in order to control a little bit the price of the coffee, and the, the, in our case, the coffee, but it was the, the, the same thing for many other commodities. And uh, at that moment, the idea was to, to try to, um, to control the production and also the, the demand of the coffee, how, to, how and where to produce, how and uh, to where to sell, and how much all of these will be cast for each of the parts. Mm -hmm. This was uh, what it, it was called the quota system. I used it to say that it's like a pizza. These people uh, had the right, the, these governments that were all together at that moment, had the right to decide the size of the pizza, who will put each ingredient in this pizza um, uh, to, to formulate the pizza. And also uh, they had the right to decide which will be the size of this slice of this pizza for each country that were interested, that was interested in buy coffees. Mm -hmm. This was the quota system that ran from uh, 63 until 85. And the ICO was the responsible, was the main operator of that, with a lot of power and doing meetings that um, here in London since the beginning. And why London? Because before the internet, all this trade for commodities used to be in London. London was used to be the hub of all of this trade. Uh, that we use it to have. In our days with the internet, it doesn't matter where we are, but uh, at that moment, it was key to be here. Right. And uh, they they come to me, they, they told to me here, the people that used it to, to be here during the 80s, that uh, in these meetings, these meetings could be 24 hours meetings without any kind of rest to negotiate who could, Produced, who could buy and which price they will have for these coffees. Well, in uh, 89, uh, the members decided that it was time to go to the free market because we we still, you already had some players, new players, planting coffee, producing coffee that were not part of the, the system, Was uh, they were not members of the, the ICO at that moment. And it was building a kind of a parallel market for, for coffee. And you had you started to have many different prices. And uh, some roasters said to me that uh, in some moments uh, you could find coffees in, a, in Europe, in, in the supermarkets in Europe, cheaper than uh, some of them were negotiating the raw material in ICO. Yeah. And then it was totally dysfunctional, the, 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 the business and uh, the market at that moment. And then they decided to go to the free market and to stop with the, the quota system. Uh, so from the 90s until now, our major um, goal is to tackle the major challenge that we, we have to try to do this kind of balance between supply and demand and to uh, support the producers with the helping and the support from the consuming countries mm -hmm. um, for having for addressing uh, the major challenge that these most mainly the most vulnerable countries uh, have and they need to 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 address like uh, climate change social uh, issues and uh, many others that we have right now the the new regulations that it's come up from many places and um the major and the key uh, responsibility of the organization right now 
it's to support them trying to understand the local uh, requirements, the local needs, and uh, from the other side to understand the needs from the consumers and the consumer countries and trying to, to put all these people together. I have a very big boarding room here <laughs> and uh, to put all these people together to negotiate. And uh, this is our major point. Yeah, I um, you know I watched a presentation that you gave a couple of years ago. It was at the uh, the World Coffee Producers Forum, and again, you know, you're talking about that balance. You know, you showed uh, a lot of the consolidation that has occurred in sort of the consumer side of things. Uh, clearly, you know that as you were mentioning that supply uh, demand balance, but then you also talked about things like social sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability, and clearly, in addition to the uh, so the macroeconomic issues, uh, you need to think about everything from weather to diseases of coffee to what happens when there's a global pandemic. Um, what's your day typically like? Uh, I mean, how what, what, what happens in the typical day uh, in your office at ICO uh, when you have to bring together, you know, as you're actually, you're dealing with a lot of people here and a lot of the, the global production, but Talk about it, your typical day and, and the types of things that come across your desk. Think about that. I have uh, 75 uh, countries as members, yeah. 25 million of producers worldwide um, coming from 50 different countries. <laughs> so... My day by day, it's uh, receiving requests and consultations for all these people and trying to find ways to support them uh, to, to address their, their challenges. Mm -hmm. I travel a lot because I decided when I come to here two years ago, I decided that since I come from the field, I come from Brazil, from a coffee producing family, I know very well uh, plantations and the market itself. I decided that it would be very good to go to these countries to know and to get in touch with these people, the young people, the women, and uh, to, to really have the contact with their realities in, in order to, to see ways to, to help. Mm -hmm. In some moments, we are talking about solutions that uh, involve more than uh, a billion, two, three billion of euros. In another moment, we are talking about solutions that we will involve maybe a thousand dollars or even less. But that can make a lot of impact and uh, can, uh, can give a lot of impact and can make a lot of difference for some people. And uh, I think uh, it's very good to, to have all these ideas together. And this is my day by day. It's, I'm going from meeting to meetings or from uh, country to country, doing a kind of benchmark of airlines and uh, airports and hotels worldwide. Sometimes I don't know in which time zone I am, <laughs> but it's okay. And uh, let's do that because I think this is very important to, to get in touch with the people and to know uh, their real needs and their capacity to, to develop uh, new uh, um, solutions, for example, in some cases, in some countries. I have a lot of requests from the country, but when I read there, I realized that uh, they don't have capacity building to, to, to do that. They, need an, uh, they don't need only money. They need much more than that. They need support to, to, teach, to, to teach the people, to have education for the people, to, to help them to select the correct people to, to, to go forward with the, the activities and the actions that we are implementing. So uh, this is my day by day. It's um, doing a lot of things. Sometimes I don't know if it's uh, morning, afternoon or evening, but mm -hmm. it's okay. No problem. I can talk with all of them. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but but uh, you know, to, to help support you and, and to organize all of that, um, you know, the ICO uh, under your leadership has created uh, the, the ICO Knowledge Hub and, uh, you know, this really important database for for partnerships and projects, public partner, private partnerships. And, you know, we, we'll put a link to this uh, in the bio of the show, but again, the projects in here, just, you know, going through it uh, before everything from, you know, 
how one promotes domestic consumption in Africa and Asia uh, on down to, you know, microfinancing in uh, Kenya, um, uh, how to uh, make up for sort of the missing middle last mile situation in, in Vietnam. Uh, there's, there's a lot of projects in here. Talk a little bit about um, uh, the ICO um, uh, knowledge uh, hub and a little bit about how this is used by the partner countries. Yeah. What I, I realized when I, when I arrived here, it was that um, we had, and uh, this is very clear for us right now, uh, we already have many, many uh, initiatives, very good initiatives spread up worldwide with a lot of money involved and in some cases, uh, some overlaps. And then we decided to create the map to join all the, uh, the solutions, the actions, and the initiatives that uh, we could have. It's a totally volunteer uh, project uh, for building that. We had a huge support from the European Union and from the International Trade Center, the ITC. Mm -hmm. And um, but now uh, it's here with us, uh, roasted by the, the ICO already. I have one economist taking care of this uh, right now. And you can include all the projects that all the initiatives that uh, you have uh, for coffee. And we are stimulating the stakeholders, the players, the consultants to, to put the data there and to consult this data. What is the, the, the major point for the hub? It's if you have a problem, consult there and see if someone already had the same problem and let's put you together, connect you to all the other people and let's see if we can replicate the solution that we have there or that solution that in another point was used can be at least a kind of uh, inspiration for your problem and to, to help you to, to, to find your, uh, your solution or some alternatives for you. And then this is the, the idea. Uh, we are a very small organization right now. We are in 15 people. I have 15 people to, uh, working with me. But we have many, many, many different partners. And for all these uh, initiatives, we always attempt with, the, uh, with these uh, partners uh, to help us uh, to, to organize the ideas and to, to have a, a project in place. Excellent. Now, uh, recently, this was back in September of 2023, um, you were involved in uh, the formation of something known as the Center for Circular Economy and Coffee. And I found this extremely interesting. We've talked a little bit about circular uh, industries on other shows. Um, and this one was, and there's a separate website, and again, we'll link to this in the bio of the show. And I was quite interested because one of the first projects that popped up on this uh, in terms of these circular principles was the, the whole issue of the coffee cherry. And it's something we don't think a lot about, but the numbers are amazing here that uh, 39 million tons of this biomass are produced. We forget that coffee comes from a cherry and are discarded. Um, and now, this is only one of the projects, but can you say a few words about uh, the Center for Circular Economy and Coffee and uh, some of these really novel sort of use opportunities that you're really focusing on here? Really interesting projects. Yes, the circular economy project, uh, it was another idea that we came up two years ago, and we launched it last year, in, again, with partners. Uh, we had a partnership with the Unido and the uh, Lavazza Foundation, ITC again, and uh, the Politecnico University from, uh, from Turin in Italy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea was, we are talking about circular economy, circular economy, and we are going to the consumer side, of the circular economy, but we can do circular economy for all the links of our chain. We can do uh, something for the entire value chain of coffee. And let's do it. Let's find something and let's try to do something together. And this was the, the idea. And uh, one of the points that we have, as you said, it was this uh, about the, the skins, the cherries, that we, in many moments and many consumers don't know that we, what we will have in a bag, it's only the seed. It's the seed roasted to, to prepare the coffee. We have yeah. a fruit. And uh, in, um, in the past, 
we use it to to discharge the, the, the fruit itself and uh, keep the, the, the seed uh, for the consumption. And let's do something uh, about this. This is one of the ideas and we have many others. And uh, on that uh, case, our idea with the website and the center is to share, again, the experiences of circular economy that we have worldwide and how to be inspired by uh, examples of the circular economy uh, from other um, products, for example, for other crops that we can use also in, in coffee. And uh, to go into more details in the, in the process to, to learn with them and to to try to scale some of these um, these solutions, we will have uh, we will launch uh, in September of this year. We will uh, launch the coffee development uh, report that will be a hundred percent focus on circular economy as well, with mm -hmm. many uh, good examples of the circular economy already in coffee. And uh, we are doing this all together with the UNIDO, ITC, Lavazza, and um, the Polytechnic Ocean, Fronturin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, you, just, you just made me think of something because, you know, one of the things it does mention on um, the Circular Economy website is it talks about sort of the bioactive compounds uh, in cherries. And it got me thinking, you know, uh, this is not just caffeine, right? I mean, there's hundreds of, of health. Uh, promoting substances is ICO. Does ICO do anything specifically in that area? Because clearly, you know, I, I went I went online before we were chatting, and there's something like in our um, uh, in the United States NIH uh, National Library of Medicine. There's over six thousand papers that have been written about the health benefits of coffee. Uh, are you as ICO focused on that at all, or is that sort of uh, for separate uh, entity? I don't know how to get involved in that. There was a moment that uh, we we had and we sponsored as ICO many of these studies. And uh, in some moments, this can be because we have for these uh, 75 members that we have, we have uh, these meetings, uh, biannual meetings, where they when they decided who, who, how can I say this? What will be the the major priorities for the next month? Right. And uh, in some moments, they they asked us to to work a lot in this uh, part of the health, and uh, we we did this, and we have a lot of uh, material here as well. Nowadays, you you have in uh, in America, you have the National Coffee Association (NCA) right. that it's uh, is sponsoring. And many of these uh, coffee and health uh, materials and uh, research, and uh, the idea is to to have a kind of a rotation. In some moments, uh, we have one organization is sponsored and focus on more in a, one place, and uh, others in another subject. And since during these last two years, we we had to put a lot of attention in uh, in subjects like. Uh, prosperity and living income for the producers, and also the regulations, the normal, the new regulations for these uh, these markets are mainly uh, related to um, human rights and also mm -hmm. deforestation. Uh, we needed to focus our attention on these topics, and um, uh, the NCA is doing more than us right now about health. Excellent. Um. I know International Coffee Day uh, is coming up. I, it was October 1st, I believe, this year. Yeah. And I know the World Coffee Conference last year was in India. Is there is there a schedule for a World Coffee Conference 2024 happening yet? Or um, are there, is that not planned yet? I, I, I couldn't find a link to that. Um, no, no, no. The World Conference, the World Coffee Conference, we, we run uh, this conference uh, each four or five years. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. It's not it's not every year. There is a, a request from our members to do this more frequently, mainly from the private sector to do this more frequently. But uh, we didn't uh, decide yet uh, when we will have the, the next one, probably in three years. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of things involved in that. And uh, 
we decided that every year it's too hard. Uh, you don't have many different topics to to have that level of uh, conference. We we had uh, as an audience last year we had almost twenty five thousand people, and um, it was said uh, to have this kind of attention. We need to have really new. Uh, subjects to talk as the circular sure. economy and others that uh, we had uh, last year and it, it's very difficult to have this every year but the idea probably will be in 26 uh, I think 26 or 27 we will have next the next one this year we will have every year we have the, the International Coffee Day uh, the International Coffee Day of uh, 1st of October uh, was established in uh, 2016 sorry, 2015, during the Expo Milano. Uh, and um, this day, it's to celebrate COP and to promote uh, coffee worldwide. The, the, the theme for this year, the subject for this year, it's uh, collaboration. And why collaboration? Because next year for the United Nations will be the, the year of the cooperativism. And I decided to do more than cooperatives because I think we need, we have also the cooperatives, but we have more collaboration than only the, the cooperatives. And then our uh, subject will be collaboration and we will launch this, um, in, I think in two or three weeks, we already launched the campaign. Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, as we get close to the wrap up of the show now, I just, um, as people that watch and listen know, I have three children and I occasionally give them the bio of our guest uh, to see what interesting things they come up with. Um, and, and I have just a couple of questions from my kids. If, if one of them, if you're not able to answer, that's fine. One was just wondering what type of coffee you like to drink. And as, as the head of the ICO, I'm not sure you're allowed to answer that, but if you're not, that's okay. Uh, and then my daughter was wondering something, you know, there's, there's all these trends now. I mean, I put cream and sugar in my coffee, but there's all these trends to put weird things in coffee nowadays from butter to mayonnaise. Um, She'd love to get your thoughts on this topic as well <laughs> while we have you. <laughs> okay. Well, I think if you'd like coffee with butter, if you'd like coffee to put salt in the coffee, it's um, no problem for me. Uh, uh, the, the most important for us is to consume the coffee. <laughs> I think uh, there are many ways, many different ways to, to take that. There are many uh, different uh, ways for, for many product, project, uh, products, I'm sorry, uh, that you can uh, use um, in that and to consume that and to take them. And uh, so for me, it's uh, like um, very good coffee and uh, my favorite coffee, I can say to you, uh, my favorite coffee that I take every day, it's, uh, it's a coffee with uh, a good body, uh, with uh, sweetness. I don't put sugar in my coffee. Mm -hmm. I don't use sugar. And uh, then I prefer the coffees that are more, uh, more sweet and more sweeter. And um, uh, usually with no very high acidity. Yeah. I take uh, coffees with a uh, high acidity um, probably once a week uh, just to appreciate. But for my day by day, I prefer coffees with uh, a little bit less acidity. And these, uh, you can find this kind of coffees in many different places. Then my, my answer is totally politically correct. <laughs> Outstanding, outstanding. No, no it's uh, it's um, you know, it's been very you know delightful um, uh, talking to you about this topic. Obviously, one that I enjoy very much, and and again to uh, have heard about your journey, um, you know, from from the plantation <laughs> to leading this major uh, international organization uh, representing uh, pretty much all of coffee production and consumption. Uh, it's just been very exciting and really wish you and your team the best uh, with, with all of these projects as you continue to think about uh, these major uh, macroeconomic, major uh, environmental and societal issues that uh, uh, are around this important beverage that we all like to consume. And so, no, it's very, very exciting stuff. 
story. Um, again, for everybody who is going to be listening to this episode of our show across the various podcast networks or who will be watching on our YouTube channel. Again, you've been spending time with Dr. Venusia Nagera, Executive Director, International Coffee Organization. Um, Dr. Guerra, I really want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while uh, about what you're up to there. Uh, obviously, thank you for what you do for, for all the producers and consumers around the world. As we like to say on our show, you know, thanks for helping to create a better and more sustainable future uh, via what you're doing. Really a great story. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And I would like just to add one point that Please. I think it's very important for the girls. I'm the first woman to, to leather a commodity international organization. This means that when we do what we like and when we do what we believe, we can get there. I think this is a very good message for all the girls and the women worldwide. Absolutely. An excellent message. And I, and I do appreciate that. And uh, wonderful having you today. Thank you.